I was 17, I almost killed someone. When I was 17, I almost killed someone. The car crash was entirely my fault. Driving at 50 miles an hour in my local neighborhood, well above the speed limit, I was arguing with my mother on my cell phone, debating what groceries to buy. I neglected to look in the rearview mirror as I turned right. The motorcyclist behind me had no time to react. On a two-way street, he crashed into me violently his body somersaulting twice, bouncing off the road, striking the pavement, and finally landing in a heap some 50 meters away. He had broken his arm, his face was bruised, and his head gashed open. But luckily, he was alive. Had there been an oncoming car, he would have died. Yet the accident was entirely preventable. Why? Human error. Had I not been speeding or distracted by my phone, I would have concentrated on the road. Accidents like mine are common. Every year, 1.3 million people around the world die on the road, and the majority of those casualties are due to human error. Data collected by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration shows that 80% of road deaths are caused by driving under the influence, calling and texting while driving, and speeding. Think about that for a second. That's four out of five people who died on the road because of negligence. At the individual level, the solution to such carelessness seems obvious. Don't drink and drive. Don't text and drive. Don't speed. For decades, we've relied on laws penalizing human error to reduce road accidents by placing heavy penalties on drunk driving and speeding and calling and texting while driving. We've tried to bully people into following the law. In many states, getting caught driving under the influence almost certainly leads to jail time. And across the US, reckless drivers face hefty fines, penalty points on licenses, and community service hours. But now we're realizing such laws aren't helping. Despite penalties, negligence-induced accidents have seen a significant increase over the past 50 years. Recent statistics show that from 2015 to 2016 alone, the number of distraction-affected crashes increased by almost 10%. And Jessica Cicchino, a vice president for research at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, has remarked that laws against distracted driving do not reduce crashes. We're making more mistakes, and our laws aren't helping. Why? One explanation for the inadequacy of traffic laws is human psychology. Specifically, humans simply aren't wired to concentrate for hours on end on something as dull as the mass turnpike. <laughs> as Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman points out, it's hard for our brains to constantly, consciously focus on anything to begin with, let alone 200 miles of highway. The road is tedious and uninteresting, unstimulating and largely uneventful. Most winding turns are safe, and after all, accidents occur only once every 165,000 miles. That is why we play music and talk to passengers when we drive, to keep our minds occupied and to distract ourselves from the boredom of the road. The dopamine rush of a Facebook notification or of a friend detailing Saturday night's party plans will always be more thrilling than making sure you're staying in your own lane. Conscious policing is hard, practically impossible. And so, even though humans don't intend it, we will always relapse into error and negligence. But lawmakers haven't kept up with 21st century psychology. And the more the accidents we encounter, the more the laws are voted into legislation. There are no signs that we'll stop being negligent, and we're still trying to reduce road accidents by penalizing human error. That's like punishing Seinfeld for being funny. <laughs> Imagine a world where we focus on saving human lives as opposed to penalizing human error. One where our solution to road deaths maximizes human flourishing as opposed to minimizing human error. One where people don't die on roads by virtue of mistakes. And one where our drivers are perfect insusceptible to error. Fully autonomous self-driving vehicles can make this vision a reality. 
By subtracting humans from the driver equation and replacing us with computers, we can make our roads safer for everyone. Our intuitions are usually off when we visualize our autonomous vehicles. Here's an image of what they actually look like as published by researchers at Stanford. Essentially, self-driving cars have no steering wheels or pedals. They do not have blinkers or gearboxes. They need not have headlights or taillights, rearview mirrors or handbrakes. Well, then how do they work? Every self-driving car is equipped with an array of radars, cameras, and light-detecting devices. Data from each of these sens sensors is integrated to create a map of the external world in a format understandable by computers. It is essential that this map constantly update to reflect real-world events. As a result, every second, new information is received from the sensors, which is reintegrated into the existing model of the world. This ensures that the car maintains an up-to-date picture of life around it. In addition, every self-driving car also employs an intelligent decision-making program that harnesses the map of the world to make navigation decisions. So when to slow down and when to speed up, when to turn right and which exit to take are entirely under the influence of the car. Practically every navigation decision is made by the system, allowing the car to drive between locations without much, if any, human intervention. The idea is to make it more or less impossible for the humans in the car to influence the car's trajectory. Even though models of driverless cars today employ a human conductor in the loop for testing purposes. With enough self-driving cars on the road, autonomous vehicles will ultimately communicate directly amongst themselves to coordinate traffic maneuvers. Soon after, lanes will become irrelevant. Stop signs will become meaningless. Speeding tickets will become archaic. But most importantly, we will have drivers that are perfect and error-free. Drivers that do not drink or text or speed. Drivers that are responsible and capable. Drivers that are non-human. Of course, this vision is still far from becoming a reality. To begin with, we have yet to build fully functional self-driving cars. Google, for example, has been developing the Google car since 2009, and despite a decade of work, efforts are still ongoing. Lyft, Ford, Uber, General Motors, Tesla, each has their own self-driving iteration. Moreover, the failures of autonomous vehicles loom large. In March 2018, a self-driving Uber Volvo struck and killed a pedestrian in Arizona, resulting in the suspension of self-driving research and development at Uber. Two Tesla cars in autopilot mode have crashed to date, both killing their passengers. These accidents teach us that human lives must be prioritized first and foremost, and that stubborn, persisting technical challenges must be overcome before autonomous vehicles can take to the road. But these accident statistics aren't unlike those from when the first vehicles were introduced to the road. In 1925, for example, motorists were 200 times more likely to die than they are today. And prospects for self-driving have never looked brighter. Billions of dollars are pouring into Silicon Valley startups and well-established companies focusing on self-driving cars. Commercial testing is also underway. In Las Vegas, for example, Lyft has partnered with Aptiv. If you're lucky enough, you could get picked up by a self-driving car with a human conductor. People have raised worries about the negative economic consequences of self-driving cars. However, Data collected by Intel and Strategy Analytics suggests that self-driving cars could add up to $7 trillion to the economy. Properly allocated, $7 trillion could lead to the generation of hundreds and thousands of jobs. Moreover, some of the brightest minds in artificial intelligence and deep learning today are working hard on the intractable technical challenges facing autonomous vehicles. If we're ever gonna solve them, it's likely soon. And once we do, adopting self-driving seems like a no-brainer. Nonetheless, it's disquieting to be at the mercy of a machine. At least for many, the idea of relinquishing control of the wheel and being chauffeured around by a computer is an uncomfortable one to swallow. Consider the residents of Chandler, Arizona, who slashed tires and hurled rocks at Google's self-driving cars only last December. This incident shows that there's still a public stigma surrounding autonomous vehicles 
that needs to be overcome. And yet, it's important to realize that this discomfort is part of a greater mental block, one that stems from a general unwillingness to change age-old ways and to explore novel ways of thinking, one that traces its roots to a general distrust in technology and unchanging attitudes toward it. Our squeamishness in the face of self-driving cars is the same unease we experience whenever we're asked to give up something we've become comfortable with. Think about the dread you felt when you last upgraded your computer. We've all been there. Transferring important documents and emails, pictures and files is so convoluted and daunting that we'd rather not buy a faster computer, even though we know doing so is the right decision. We're so comfortable with our outdated ways of life that we're unprepared to change, even when changing would add value to our society. Have we become so comfortable with texting and driving? So comfortable with distractions behind the wheel? So comfortable with the idea that we're not going to be the ones who get into an accident, that we're unprepared to adopt technology that would make our roads safer? I know I was several years ago. But at the age of 17, I almost killed someone. More broadly speaking, we need to undertake an attitude shift. One from distrust in machines and technology to trusting that they can help us overcome problems society faces today. Computers do not suffer the same physical, psychological, computational, or biological constraints as humans. Employing technological solutions to problems can thus help eliminate human error from the equation, making our world a safer place. Using technology to improve lives is something I've dedicated myself to. Once I graduate college, I'll be working as a software engineer at Lyft, a company at the forefront of driverless technology. And I can't wait to play my part in the self-driving revolution. Autonomous vehicles are only one example of how we can totally rethink the way we solve problems. They teach us that by solving for something as opposed to solving against it, we can dramatically alter our perspective on life. Technology can help us solve for saving human lives. Thank you.